What sort of evidence will we be looking for when we go out buy some clear soup? Well, and what advantages it give us? Well, the advantage it gives us, of course, is that when we have to go to the certification body for our product, if it contains clear soup, we have the evidence we need for that component of our, of our, dem of our demonstration. So we have a uh, checklist here of sort of things that you might want to look for. One of them I've already emphasized, the fact that it has explicitly stated functional safety requirement claims. This software will do X in, under condition Y 96.823479% of the time distributed in the following manner. So what does it do? What does it do, don't do? And one of the things that is sometimes confused in this type of uh, uh, evidence, availability and reliability. I very much try to separate these. The system is there and responding, availability. The system is telling me the right answers, is giving the right answers, reliability. The reason that we have to pull these apart is we can treat them separately, we can argue about them separately, and we can provide evidence about them separately. And in many systems, availability is more important than reliability. We can take the occasional wrong answer as long as the system continues to give answers. In other systems, it's the other way around. You know, my, the thing that does my income tax every year I would rather have reliability rather than availability. If it's unavailable for an hour or so, you know, that's fine. If it gives me the wrong answer, I can go to prison. So, you know, there I'd rather have reliability than availability. The system architecture, what is the architecture of the particular piece of COTS, uh, uh, of clear soup that you're using? Does it lend itself to producing evidence? I'm going to argue, I would argue, obviously, that the QNX operating system, being a microkernel, does exactly that. The architecture inherently supports safe operation, safer operation. The process, yep, not, a prob not, not something to be dismissed. That Yes, has it been produced in a, in a controlled manner? Are all the logs, has all the evidence been preserved? The code inspection evidence, the, so the, the static analysis evidence, is it all there? <coughs> The fault tree. I find the fault tree is the most important part of any product. And often when I'm with customers, I see really, really good fault trees, qualitative rather than quantitative. You know, they, there's been a lot of work done on the failure model, on the fault tree model, none of it quantified. And how you can use that to demonstrate anything, I really don't know. So one thing that you're going to need if you're going to be using COTS or, or SOUP is some numbers on this particular component here so that you can feed it into your fault tree. I use um, Bayesian networks for fault trees because it gives me the option of using noisy OR, which I think is absolutely essential as, an, as a function in a fault tree. A lot of fault tree tools don't allow you to use noisy OR, and I just don't know how anybody ever builds a fault tree with those. There's a well, white paper on our website, I think, uh, talking about that if you're interested, or the break or afterwards. I'm a bit of an um, evangelist for the Bayesian network approach to fault trees and also to putting together the safety case for auditors, you know, of which the fault tree is one part. Design, what design artifacts are there? Again, one area that I find very, very, very useful is what we call retrospective design verification. You know, this is the traditional V model, U model, whichever you like. Normally, we can trace things pretty well between requirements and architecture, between architecture and system design. And then things go berserk between design and implementation. Thousands of small decisions are made, lots and lots of um, byway, alleyways, and what have you are explored, and the system does not look at all like it was designed. So any design verification that was done here really becomes useless, or it becomes very, very, very difficult to push it through to the, the implementation. So one thing that I recommend very strongly is taking some design verification tool, 
Um, I use Spin. Um, sorry for the tools, tools vendors here. Uh, I'm, I, I sort of use, tend to use a lot of open source stuff. Spin is open source, which gives me the linear temporal logic analysis that I can use to demonstrate, in fact, to prove that this protocol will never lock up, that this system will never deadlock, will never live lock, that those sort of things that you can express in linear temporal logic are impossible to occur. Not just I've tested and they didn't occur, they cannot logically occur. And taking that back from the implementation, extracting how the implementation was done, and reworking the design validation, I find, again, it produces a vast amount of evidence for the, for the certification body. We have proved that this system cannot lock up in the following ways. Not we have demonstrated it by testing. Static analysis. We've got static analysis uh, representatives here today, obviously. Um, obviously, everybody does shallow static analysis, lint and what have you. Um, semantic static analysis, and again, I'm going to mention open source tools because I don't want to get involved in a tools debate. Uh, Cochinel as a semantic analysis uh, tool, um, I find very useful. Um, the one I find most useful probably for C programming is CLI because it does symbolic execution, and symbolic execution is getting very, very close to that borderline between static and dynamic analysis. And again, can provide, in some cases, in fact, quite a few cases, can provide proof. Not just we did not run into this in testing, but it cannot occur that malloc is called without free being called, or free being called without malloc previously having been called, or a null pointer being dereferenced, and so on. Now, you could ask why you'd be writing a safe application in C, but that's... Uh, Proven in use data, I think this is my last slide. Some of these numbers we've been talking about have been pretty big. That 10 to the minus 9, you know, uh, probability of failure per hour. I did a little sum last night. 10 to the 9 hours, as you may or may not know, is about 114,000 years. My software fails about once every 114,000 years. Is that okay? Well, yeah, this is pretty difficult to demonstrate. Let me give you another number. The QNX operating system is used about 100 million hours a month. We have evidence, demonstrated statistics. 100 million hours a month. So one second, that 10 to the 9 hours is not now an, a target which is completely outside the range of statistics we have. In fact, if I go back to 2002, we have very copious records of how our software has been used, what the fault rate has been, all of this sort of stuff, and we are actually well over 10 to the 9 hours, and growing at 100 million, 150 million hours a month. So, Proven in use numbers for that open that for that uh, soup or whatever you buy can provide another area of useful evidence. So the whole of this section has been basically about evidence. The safety manual, of course, will come with the software. Do not do this. Do not do this. Don't use this software in the following way. What's that reflecting? It's reflecting the functional safety requirements. The functional safety requirements say, we guarantee we will do X as long as the conditions are Y. And basically the safety manual is going to say, make sure the conditions are Y, because that's where we offer our guarantees. So this is the sort of thing I would be looking for in soup. Now, of course, certification is going to be certification of the device, not of the components. But if you take into that certification certified components, it doesn't have to make the life a lot easier, obviously. We have values for this. We have a certificate on this software. Failure rate is this. We've put that into our fault tree. We've done our roll-up analysis in the fault tree. We've done all of this, that, and the other. And look what we get at the top. Ten to the uh, 7.685 times 10 to the minus 9. Give us our certificate, please. Yeah. That's the justification we're looking for. 
So, in summary, I see this, I see a problem coming on the medical area where I'm not a specialist, um, that has been around in the other safety critical software industries, industrial automation, as I say, uh, nuclear power station control, railway signaling control, all this sort of stuff for a long time. The complexity of the software is getting to the point, well, has got to the point where we can't test it. The railways have acknowledged that. If you can test it, it's not software, it's hardware. If you can't test it, it's software. So understanding the functional safety requirements of the system becomes essential. We can no longer assume that the system is inherently safe. Because of the complexity of the system, the assumption is the system is, in, in, is inherently unsafe and we need some functionality to keep it safe. Safety requirements need to be specified, obviously. Building your own system from scratch typically is not going to work. Soup is allowed under um, 61304. Uh, oh, 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 my number's muddled up now. Um, if it's clear soup, cots can be clear soup, assuming that information is available. And basically, whenever you're bringing in clear soup, demand that it is clear soup. Show me your functional safety requirements so that I can be sure that it matches what I need and prove, get, show me the evidence that demonstrates that you meet those functional safety requirements. I think I have got, us, I have got back half of the uh, time that we were running over. And again, no time for questions, I'm afraid, but uh, I'll be around, well, I'm around all day, so if anybody's got any questions, I'd be delighted to take them. <laughs>